we start, I need to ask the audience. We have uh, someone here video our presentation. Does anyone have an issue with having a video camera rolling? Thanks for coming. He's just here to film us. So, no objections? All right, so we're good. All right, so let's start. I'm William Heath. I'm William Rice. And we're here to tell you about our project, the Context-Based Similarity Metric. So the drive of our project is we're concerned with quantifying uh, the different similarity of information within two strings when we know some prior knowledge. We have some prior knowledge about the strings. So uh, this is basically encompassed in two major areas of mathematics. Uh, one of them is information theory. It's the study of storage, measurement, and transmission of information. And it's dealing with large amounts of information. Uh, the second one is computability theory, which is the formal theory of computation. It's also called recursion theory. And it's just a bunch of uh, mathematical logic based on whether a function is computable or not computable. So in 1936, Alan Turing really paved the way for computability theory when he invented the Turing machine, which is really just a mathematical formulation of a computer. And then 1948, information theory emerged essentially all at once in um, Claude Shannon's paper, A Mathematical Theory of Communication. And his approach was primarily concerned with the information content of a message given all possible messages that could have been sent. So it was um, kind of source dependent. This is in contrast to algorithmic complexity uh, or the algorithmic approach to information theory that uh, people were exploring in the 60s when Solomonoff, Kolmogorov, and Chaitin co-discovered algorithmic, algorithmic complexity, which was more concerned with the inherent information content of an object. So some of the tools they use are like the shortest description of that object. So it was independent of any source. And then in the 70s, DNA sequencing came along and became a driver for the need for some of these similarity metrics. There was more uh, of a practical need for these comparisons to be made. And then in 1990s, um, Ming Li invents the similarity metric, was, which was kind of like this optimal way of comparing two uh, binary strings using the Kolmogorov complexity. So here's a quick overview. We need to go over Kolmogorov complexity, uh, what a metric is, and the similarity metric, which mainly <coughs> other people have used. Uh, we need to go over those to fully understand our study, a context-based similarity metric. So let's start with Kamalgraf complexity. The Kamalgraf complexity of some object X is the length of the shortest program that you can feed into a Turing machine to compute X. So here's a visual to help. We have some coding string X star, which is a short description for X and you feed it through this universal term machine, it runs some kind of algorithm, and it outputs what you're looking for, x. So the complexity is an inherent property of the string x. We say x is compressed to x star uh, to the coding string, and the Kamalgar complexity is concerned with the length, the length of this coding string that's the shortest description. And it's, it's the semantic information we're worried about. We're concerned with the shortest possible way we can write something. So let's look at what we mean by compression before we move on. So consider these two strings. This one is has low complexity, and this one has high complexity. So we could compress this first one by saying write 0 16 times. That's a shorter description. The second one with higher complexity, well, we can't compress that very much because there's just a lot of randomness and there's not a lot of regularity. So if we want to output this, we'd have to write something, output it over here, we have to write something fairly close to this guy to feed through the universal Turing machine to output that actual string. And all of that is not, you can't compute values for that. They're all ideal values. Every Kolmogorov complexity is not computable. So the only difference in regular and conditional Kolmogorov complexity is that you get to start with some other input. And that input can be anything. Uh, in this case, we'll call it Y. And you, you're basically saying how you get from y to x. And all the changes you make to y are just in x star. So we write k x bar y, x given y, and it's still equal to the length of the coding string x star. You just get to start from y. All right, so we've been throwing the word metric around, but, but it does have a precise mathematical definition. It's also called an information, um, or, or uh, sorry, a distance function. And it just takes a... Uh, two inputs and outputs a positive real number. So this is kind of intuitively what we want a metric to do, give us a distance. And that distance is always positive, unless the two objects are the same, in which case the distance between them is zero. 
Um, it obeys symmetry and it obeys the triangle inequality. We say a metric is normalized if it's bound between zero and one. All right, so up to this point, we've gone over how we can quantify the algorithmic information of uh, the shortest program of some string. But what we want to do is we want to measure the distance between two strings. We're dealing with two complexities now. So Ming Li and other people have done this using the similarity metric. Um, we see that it uses regular and conditional Kolmogorov complexity. The numerator in this equation is just the mutual information between x and y. The denominator is just a normalization factor to get between the value of 0 and 1 for a distance measure. Uh, this is universally used for any two strings x and y, and it's best used without prior knowledge. If you do know something like about what's important and what's not, this isn't the best equation to use. So remember, Kolmogorov complexity is non-computable. So we use something, or in practice, people use the normalized compression distance. And you see that the Ks are replaced by Cs and a couple of the terms change. Uh, this is an approximation of the similarity metric. And the Cs, that just means that you're using a compression algorithm to calculate each one of these terms. All right, so we said the similarity metric is the best for any two arbitrary strings, but you know, what if we knew something about the strings of he ahead of time? How could we incorporate that information? And so kind of the, our whole project is just showing how to use the similarity metric better if we know something about the strings ahead of time. So our first context, our simplest case is, well, what if we know which part of the string is signal and which part is noise? This um, helps us get to this inherent problem of Kolmogorov complexity in that it treats some noise as if it were signal. So given a string x and that we have, say, 100 digits of noise, so just kind of randomness, and then this message 1110, Kolmogorov complexity might say the shortest string or programmed code for that is just the, you know, the string itself because this is real random and there's no good compression. Um, but intuitively, we'd rather have a program that says, oh, let's give 100 random digits and then this message 1110. Uh, the problem with this is that that same program might output an x prime that's different from the original. So they're different at the noisy part. Um, so they wouldn't be equivalent. To fix this problem, we're just going to define them to be equivalent. So we're going to set equivalence classes. So in this first context, we're going to assume the thing we know about um, the strings are where they're signal and where they're noise. And so each string x will have this binary vector p associated with it, describing where the relevant positions are. And we say relevant and signal, an important part of the string, ought to mean the same thing. That's just the part that we care about. Um, and so here's the P for that X, it's zero at all the noisy parts and one's at the signal. Um, and you'll note that each P defines a new domain, SP, for the similarity metric. And so it's going to be in the domain if, it has, if they all have the same P. Within that domain, you can see that Z1 and Z2 would be in the same equivalence class because they have the same value at the bold parts, the, the important positions. X and Y would be in different equivalence classes. So our metric, we are looking at a distance over the equivalence classes, D star R metric over equivalence classes. And that's the same thing as the similarity metric taking exactly whatever you define as important and throwing everything else away. So here's a visual. You have, consider these two strings, X and Y, where the bull parts are the important parts. Basically what we're doing is we're getting rid of all the noise and we're just concatenating the important parts. And then these are the strings that we use. <coughs> so our results are about what we'd expect. This was simulated in MATLAB um, using a bunch of strings from the same equivalence classes. So this is measuring from equivalence class X to Y, but the similarity metric took different elements in those equivalence classes and gave us a bunch of different outputs. This was at 90% signal, um, but our, our metric gave us a consistent value because it only it, it treats the equivalence classes as one entity. Um, and so this is at 90% signal, so you can see that that 10% noise created some perturbation. And most of the time it was an overestimate of the distance, meaning that it's kind of hard to get two randomized things to accidentally be similar. But occasionally it does happen that we see some falling below the line, especially for 90% signal to noise ratio. Um, we wanted to play with this idea of that ratio, and so we did a comparison. So over on that right, we had that previous case where it's 90% um, important. 90% signal, and so it's about the same as the similarity metric because we're plugging in essentially the whole string. But over here, the, it gets noisier and the overestimate gets worse. This spike is just a reminder that this is a probabilistic thing and we're running a simulation, so outliers happen. 
So let's, it's time to complicate it a little. Context two we incorporate something called the degree of importance, and this is directly involved with the p vector. Uh, instead of using zeros and ones, we use values between zero and one to say how important or unimportant something is. So that means that we have to define a threshold value. Call it sigma, and in this case, let's sigma equal 0.4. So when you apply that to p, you get p prime, and all that is is if it's below 0.4, it turns into a zero. If it's above 0.4, it turns into a one, and that tells you what's important in baking stuff for equivalence classes. Because the p prime kind of does simplify a little bit to our previous context, uh, we get a similar looking picture. So this is again the threshold instead of signal to noise, but um, they're kind of uh, the threshold can kind of be thought of as a proxy for the signal to noise ratio because as we change that the ratio changes um, and here I've plotted the spread of all the different similarity metric values at that um, for that measurement so each um, this is for different thresholds over here the threshold is zero so everything is signal and we get the same result that the similarity metric does but we have the same overestimate is worse for no more noise as we'd expect so let's complicate it even more Context three, we're, we're concerned with complicating how we get a P. So this time we're going to construct P from an ensemble of strings. So consider ensemble E made up of N strings. Now we, yeah, there we go. From this, we're going to make a consensus string. And that consensus string is just going to be the mode at each vertical entry in E. Now keep in mind, this is one source sending multiple, one source E, sending multiple uh, messages X1, X2 to Xn. So it might be trying to say the same thing, and the noise and the similarity, or the noise and the uh, signal might be kind of the same ratio, but in that noise part, it's gonna be more random. Uh, from that, we get a P <coughs> vector, and that's just based off the frequency of the mode value from the, uh, from the uh, ensemble. And from here, we just apply our context to, apply some threshold value, call it sigma equals 0.4 again, and we get P prime, and now we are ready to start setting up equivalence classes. So from here, we just described this, the same message being sent multiple times from one source. We need to apply that to two messages being sent by two different sources and apply those messages. So we're looking at two ensembles. From ensemble X and ensemble Y, we get that mode-based consensus sequence, and from, uh, from some threshold value and some frequency, we get P prime for each of those as well. So we define our next metric to say, when P, P prime X equals P prime Y, which is equal to one, there exists a signal. That's a position that we care about, that we really want to count. So for all entries in an ensemble, we have to change the position uh, to the symbol of its consensus uh, string which all that's saying is if there's a one, one right here, that's important. So positions one, three, four, and five, those are important. You go back to all those strings in the ensembles, go to those positions, and then change it to, what was it, zero or one, zero or one at that place. So to explain these crazy results, it's kind of helpful to think of, to explain the simulation, how we simulated this in MATLAB. Um, so we just used ensembles of 10 strings, uh, length of 1,000, um, but because there were only 10 strings, the frequencies that the, the mode, the consensus string could take on um, were only 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, so on and so forth. Um, and so that makes it significantly discrete, and so we get these jumps. And that, so the P prime value doesn't change, or the P prime value is 0 up until here, and for when it was zero, I said that's, that's comparing noise to noise. Let's just say the distance is maximal. Um, but then beyond that, we see the same kind of idea where we get this overestimate using the similarity metric most of the time. But here it's you know, some overestimate, some underestimate. So ours is still a refinement. All right, so three points for future work. One, you can use a different compression algorithm and our same techniques and same equivalence classes and see if we get the same thing. Uh, second one is our next context which is going to be how we construct equivalence classes. And we're going to do it based on the weighted Hamming distance, uh, which is just another metric. And you have to incorporate some tolerance value omega to say what's important and what's not, what you actually care about. Um, the third one is the importance distribution. So this is pretty much our context three that we just finished going over. Uh, Shannon's entropy is 
an information theoretic way of calculating a P vector. And to vi help visualize that, here's a sequence logo. And it's built on ensembles of messages, all trying to say, kind of trying to say the same thing, but there's noise in it, there's inconsistencies. So what we would want to do is compare two sequence logos uh, to one another with that information about the consensus string and the frequencies, which that's our context three. So what's cool is you get to use real world, like real world data and our application of it to tell uh, how similar or different something is. So we'd like to thank you guys for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. It took us a long time to wrap our heads around all this stuff. So uh, there's no such thing as a question of what well, we'd like to open the floor for questions now. Does anybody have any questions? And we have time for a few. Hey, can you film these questions? Yeah. Um, going back to what was it, the, uh, the condensation part where you first started talking about con condensing, uh, I was thinking about like why not condense by converting from binary to decimal. You want to pull up the other PowerPoint? Oh yeah. Let's start with that. Just getting back. We made a question. PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, so the <coughs> the the compression algorithm we use is based based on this like kind of um, state of the art method for compression. So we just use the one that is um, kind of ca canonical. Um, it's based on something called the Limpel Ziv algorithm, and that's what people most people use to approximate the Kolmogorov complexity. Um, so this was just kind of an example of a compression. That's not really what a real program would do. Okay. Um, so you're just being we're looking at what it means to shorten a description of a string. Right. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking that you know that would if you're compre in compressing in like pretty much any kind of like freeform words, I would imagine it would be binary to decimal. Yeah, that all depends on the algorithm you use. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Does anybody have any other questions?